Welcome to the Good Food CFO Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Delavan, once again, joined by our producer, Chelsea Steer. Hey, Sarah. So we have come to the end of season 11 here on the podcast. Yeah, Chelsea, what a season this has been. Oh my goodness. If I'm thinking back to everything we've covered this season, we had a conversation about AI. We talked quite a bit about industry consolidation. We finally had a conversation about co-ops and employee ownership. And of course, we talked about financial foundations like cash flow and margin and profitability. And we highlighted how three different founders are doing things differently in our fan favorite Baba Yacht episodes. Yeah. And now here we are. It's the beginning of September and you know what that means. Q4 is knocking on our doors. If you are watching on YouTube, you can see me shaking my head right now because here's the deal. I do not like talking about the winter holiday season any earlier than I have to. But the truth of the matter is this is a very important time of year for food businesses. The holiday season is a huge revenue opportunity for many food businesses. And, you know, I've talked about this before on the podcast. If we are not planning ahead. If we are not heading into holiday season, you know, with clear minds and and clear visions of of what we're doing, we can come out the other side having earned no profits, right? And what is the point of working so hard, selling so much of your wonderful product if you have nothing to show financially for it? So today, despite my wishes, you know, the right thing to do is to spend a short amount of time in this segment, sharing some resources that we have to help you prepare for the gift giving season. And then you'll also hear my conversation with a recent CFO office hours attendee. Her name is Kate. She's the founder of Savorista. And we're talking about how our work together is going to support her in having her most profitable Q4, but also a profitable business going forward. Sarah, but I I do want to add that the other reason that we're talking about holiday prep today is that as we said at the top, this is our season finale, and we're actually taking a little bit longer of a break between seasons this time. We are. I mean, we try to practice what we preach, right? And Baba Yacht, like we <laughs> we work on that and and strive to do that here in our business as well. It has been a really wonderful summer. It has been a very busy summer. I had the opportunity to spend time with family and time out in nature. And I know that a lot of you listening have also been traveling. I want to say thank you to those of you who continue to listen to us week after week during your busy you know, summer season. But we also recognize that some of you aren't able to listen every week like you normally do. Yeah, we, we historically pretty much every year see a dip in listenership during the summer. You know, you guys are trying to have just as much fun as we're having over here. Yeah. So we're going to be taking, as you said, Chelsea, a little bit of a longer break. And so those of you who aren't caught up, will have time. Those of you who are caught up, we've got some resources for you to get a jump start on the holiday season prep. Yeah. So to be totally clear, we are going to be off for the next three weeks and our season 12 premiere is going to happen on Monday, September 30th, which basically is the start of Q4. (laughs) So as I started this whole spiel about, that is the other reason that we are talking about this today. Yeah. So Sarah, before we get into like all the resources that we're going to be sharing today, I would love for you to tell us actually a little bit about your conversation with Kate. Oh yeah, definitely. So we talk a lot about why I asked Kate onto the podcast like in the main episode, but I'll share a little bit about that here too. So many, I mean, really every founder who comes to office hours, I think makes the most of their time there. Kate was one of those founders who really just actually showed up before day one (laughs) with data and like really ready to do the work. And the topic that she dove into during office hours, her shipping offer and her subscription offers felt really timely. So we invited Kate onto the show to talk about her process. As we discussed in a recent episode, critical thinking is something that we are trying to teach here, right? Something that we think is really important because there is no one size fits all way to build a business. There is no one size fits all shipping offer or subscription offer. And so I really thought that having Kate here to talk through her process, talk through what the four weeks and office hours were like and where she landed 
in her critical thinking and decision making process could be helpful, insightful, and perhaps inspiring to the founders who are listening. Yeah, I know when I was listening to this episode, number one is that I don't ever get to go to office hours, right? <laughs> That's I get to go to all the live events, the book club, the member events. I, you know, I'm here on the podcast. But that's the one thing I don't get to do because I don't have my own business, right? Yeah. So it was really fun to listen to you and Kate talk about the work that you did together and to really have a better understanding of what that looks like in office hours. And then the second thing I want to highlight from this conversation is there was a moment where Kate was talking about some scenarios that she was kind of playing through as she was working through this whole process. And... In one of those scenarios, she was really looking at what would happen financially if she lost customers. Yeah. And she said something that I've heard many times before here in the Good Food CFO universe, if you will, right? <laughs> Even in a scenario where she would lose revenue, she still saw that her profit dollars grew. Yeah. I'm so glad that you pulled that out as as like something to highlight from the episode because you're right. We see it when we talk about businesses that are right sizing, right? Trying to not serve everyone, but to serve the right customer at the right price point and the right profit margin and the right channel, right? And so you may see either steady revenue or a decrease in revenue, but an improvement to your profitability. And I think it's a very scary thing to think about quote unquote losing revenue, but you can do that and increase your profitability, not just in terms of margin, but in actual dollars. And Kate is sharing that, as you mentioned in the episode. And I think as many times as we can talk about that and the different scenarios in which that plays out, the better. Yeah, totally. And I would just say that if you're listening and you want to dig into like this same kind of work around your shipping offer, you can start by going back and listening to, this is our first resource here, mm -hmm. episode 26. It's called How to Create a Profitable Shipping Offer. Yep. It's going to be a really good listen just to get your mind kind of start to turning around like what you can be doing in mm -hmm. terms of shipping um, or even how your current shipping offer might be affecting your business in ways that you don't realize. Yep. And then from there, if you want to really start to make changes to your shipping offer, again, especially as we head into the holiday season, I would also suggest taking or creating a profitable shipping offer workshop, which is available on our website. Yep. I think that's a great recommendation. And you bring up a great point. Like somebody might be listening and thinking, well, we've had our shipping offer forever. It's fine. Like we're not going to change as we head into the holiday. Remember that shipping rates can change as we head into the holiday. Your shipping offer may or may not be profitable. And so if you've got more people, you know, taking you up on that offer, it could have impacts that you aren't anticipating on your profitability. So it is just a great time to do a check-in to see if a change could be helpful um, or if you're all good. And then lastly, if you've gotten through that workshop and you still feel like you want some support or you want to like talk through the, the numbers, you can always join Sarah in office hours. Yeah. You still have time to join our September session. That one is going to be starting next week uh, on Thursday, the 12th. Or if you need a little bit more time, maybe you want to work through some of all this stuff first before coming to office hours, you can always join our October session, that one is starting on Thursday, October 10th. And passes for both of those sessions are available on our website. And something that Kate talks about in this episode is the value that she got from having not just feedback from me around the financials, but feedback and insight from other founders. And I think, as you say often here, Chelsea, like we work in silos as entrepreneurs and solopreneurs and founders. And when you're trying to make a decision about, okay, here are some options that I have, and I just want to talk through this, or I want to get some people's feedback on you know, what they may have done in their business, Office Hours is a great place for that as well. Absolutely. So Sarah, besides shipping, what else should founders be thinking about as we head into and they start preparing for the holiday season? Yeah. I mean, Bundles and discounts immediately jump to the top of my mind, right? The holidays are the season of gift giving. And so people love to bundle 
products together. They people, you know, love a gift basket, right? They love a sample pack. They it's it's really nice to give sort of an abundant gift to someone. And so as a CPG founder or a food founder of any kind, if you're thinking about bundling your products, there's actually some strategy that I love to take into the process. You know, you can think about the strategy of like high profit and low profit products coming together in a bundle, right? To really offer value to your customers. You might take the strategy of taking your highest margin, kind of most profitable products and putting those together in a bundle. So you can offer a pretty deep discount and still make money on the product. So we've got a really simple bundles calculator where you can pop in the cost and the price point of all of your products and then kind of do the work of building bundles and seeing how profitable are they. There's even the option to add in, you know, special ribbon, special box, special filler, like the costs that are associated with those things. So you can really see the total cost of this bundle product that you're putting together. The next place we go to is discounts. And the reason I think discounts need a little bit of attention is because it's not a one-to-one relationship between the discount you give and the loss of margin that your product has. So for example, if you're doing a 10% discount, it doesn't mean that you're losing 10% of the profit margin on that product. And so sometimes when you're thinking through like how deep of a discount can I give or what will work for my customers, A, it might be different for different product lines, different packages, things like that. And B, maybe you can give a little bit more of a discount than you originally thought you could and still be profitable. Maybe you can't give as much of a discount as you thought and still remain profitable. So it's just good to do a check-in and really know what the effects of your bundling and your discounts are going to be as you head into the holidays. So we also have a discount calculator that I love for folks to use at this time of year. Totally. And and with the bundle and discounting tool, as well as I would say the shipping workshop, with all of those, you're going to get step-by-step guide videos with you, Sarah, as well as those calculators and all the resources that they need to work through any of that planning. Exactly. But before they do any of that work, like where should a founder really start the planning process? That is a great question because I think and pretty typical for people to just go, oh, I got to have bundles. I must discount. I have to participate in these special you know, shopping days in order to maximize my revenue over the holidays. But as I've talked about in previous episodes, and I'm going to call out a resource here, episode 78, if you don't see episode numbers on your podcast player, which some of us do and some of us don't, the title of the episode is Planning Your Most Profitable Q4 Yet. I've talked about in that episode how during my my food sourcing days when I was working at a catering company, we had a very busy holiday season. We worked our tails off. We reached the point where we were like, oh, we're at max orders. Whew, we're done. Great job, everybody. And then more orders were accepted. Our entire like plan that we thought we had was thrown off. Our communication got worse. Our spreadsheets got broken. Our, you know, our, our ordering got confusing. Just everything went kind of to shit, if I'm being really honest with you. And at the end, when we, when we were sort of reviewing the numbers, like how was our Thanksgiving season, we weren't profitable. And it was not something that we shared with the whole team, but because I was involved in the numbers of the business, I was able to see it. And it was like, all of that work, all of those extra hours, the overtime that people put in, it didn't pay off in the end for the business and for the founders. And so that experience really makes step number one for me, creating a vision for your holiday season. You have control over if you discount or not. And utilizing the tools that we mentioned are going to help you make that decision. Maybe you will for some things. Maybe you won't. Maybe you'll do one sale. Maybe you'll do none. Like You have control over that and must do what is best for your business. You also have control over the days and the hours that your physical store is open or how long your online store stays open and accepting orders for shipment right before the holiday. I think as Baba Yachts, we have to think about ourselves and our team, right? The health of of our people as well as the health of our bank accounts. And so setting some boundaries, setting some goals and, and striving to reach those and then being satisfied if you do, if going beyond those goals means 
you know, overtime hours for your team members or, you know, spending more on certain things or ordering last minute items to be able to fulfill an order. All of those things burn people out, kind of, you know, create some chaos within the business and also lead to less profitability over the holiday season. Yeah. So it sounds like what you're saying is that people should, and don't judge me for saying this, Baba Hot. <laughs> Build a business. Wait, is that right? Oh, Bahabat. Right? Yes. <laughs> Building a holiday on your own terms. Bahayat. There you go. Yeah, okay. you got it. <laughs> yes, they should build a holiday on their own terms, Chelsea. They absolutely should. Awesome. So what we're going to do to support that is we're going to link to all of the resources that we just mentioned in the show notes so that you can pick and choose which ones you want to utilize. We're also going to have a link in there for office hours. If you are looking for some more hands-on support or camaraderie, right, connection, uh, collaboration, collaboration yeah. yeah, with some other founders, your peers, you can do that as well. But you know what, Sarah, I am so ready for them to hear this conversation with Kate. Yeah, let's get to it, Chels. Fall can be a stressful time for food founders as you prepare for the holiday shopping season. Let the Good Food CFO help you ease that stress by joining us for CFO office hours. Seats in our September and October sessions are available now. During your first meeting, you'll work with Sarah and a small group of your peers to set goals for your business in Q4. Each week, Sarah will provide guidance and accountability to make sure you're on track, and the connection with your fellow founders will ensure you don't feel alone in the process. Each session is limited to four founders so that you are guaranteed the time and attention you need to create your most profitable holiday season yet. Grab your seat now before they're gone. Visit thegoodfoodcfo.com and click on coaching to purchase your pass today. And now back to the show. Kate, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Sarah. It's great to see you again. You too. You know, as I mentioned in the intro, you were a member of uh, our CFO office hours in the not too distant past. And, you know, it's a relatively new offering mm -hmm. for us. We just launched that in January of 2024. And I had a vision for it. I, I wanted founders to be able to come be part of a small group, get one on one coaching around something fairly specific in their business and do some critical thinking right? With mm -hmm. me as like a partner or a bit of a guide, right? But but really you you leave with homework, you come back week after week, hopefully advancing toward a goal or an outcome that, that you're hoping for. And so far people have really been, I want to say like executing in a way that is like living up to the expectation that I had for the office hours, which feels really amazing. And you were one founder in particular that really stood out to me if I if I can oh, say that <laughs> because a you had you brought in something and we're going to kind of go into detail about like mm -hmm. you know the, the questions that you were kind of examining in your business but so many founders need to do that same work I wanted to invite you here to sort of talk about it with everyone especially as we're heading into holiday season but also I really loved your preparedness <laughs> for each and every call, like I was looking back through the emails and you had provided financial data, like from meeting number one, like all the way through, it was really fun to think with you and go, well, what does this look like? And I just thought what a great example to bring to the podcast of someone who from my side seemed to make the most of office hours and with a topic that is really important to a lot of founders. So I, I just want to thank you again for being here to kind of share the experience and some other important information with our founders who are listening. Well, thanks, Sarah, for having me on. I really enjoyed and got a lot out of the, the office hours. Like We covered a lot in just a few weeks and hopefully, you know, our conversation will be valuable to your other listeners as well. I think it will be. Yeah. So why don't we start by you telling us a little bit about your business, Savorista? Yes. So Savorista crafts astonishingly delicious decaf and half-calf coffees. We start with really great coffee beans. We only use natural ingredients to remove the caffeine. And the end product is the coffee tastes delicious. Yeah. I think the idea of selling decaf and half-calf coffees is genius. I'm, <laughs> Thank you. 
I I am that person who kind of always has a coffee cup on my desk. And when you reach afternoon, you know, full calf coffee is not great. My mom will have like one cup of, you know, full calf coffee in the morning. And then if she has a second cup, she always goes like to a half calf and learning about sort of the harsh chemicals that can be used in the decaffeination process, which I know you you don't do at Savorista is really amazing. And then also like it, it can definitely be hard to find a delicious <laughs> decaf and half calf option. So Basically, thank you for what you do. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you, and and you're totally right. A lot of our customers have shared similar reasons that you know they either want to reduce their caffeine or eliminate caffeine or want more coffee without yeah. more caffeine. So we've found a really warm reception to to our products. Yeah, I think of coffee as like my thinking beverage. If I'm mm. sitting down for like a meeting, if I'm sitting down for you know to dig into my spreadsheets, like a fresh cup of coffee is just I don't know. It just makes Absolutely. it better. It's like uh, a yeah. It's it's very comforting. It's also just such a way that in North America we connect with others and, and around mm-hmm. the world too of you know, oh let's grow grab a coffee and like let me learn more about you or let me share this crazy thing that's happening in my life. And yeah. Coffee is a you know a companion for for many of us and either various points in life or for various reasons we don't always want all of the caffeine. Yeah. I love that coffee is a companion. That's amazing. <laughs> so okay, so take us back to you know, prior to you joining Office Hours, we didn't know mm-hmm. each other. It was also a very exciting thing. I love meeting new people inside of Office Hours. So why did you join Office Hours? Sort of what was going on in your business and what was your goal on sort of day one as we were getting started? Yeah. So I first even heard about Office Hours because I was binging your podcast, actually, and Amazing. just finding that really valuable. I was like listening to all kinds of great episodes with different founders that you had interviewed or podcast with you and Chelsea. So I, I already had a sense of like what I thought you were like and what I thought I could potentially get out of it. And I was really hoping to have somebody to like be a thought partner, to think mm-hmm. through some profitability challenges that I was working through and also really wanted the accountability that came with showing up at office hours every day. I had a, a four month old baby and, you know, was, was juggling a lot of things. And yeah. I knew that even when I didn't have a baby, sometimes the, the big structural pieces of your business, just, it's hard to create the space to do the analysis and give them the thought that they deserve because you are sometimes fighting fires day in and day out. Yeah. And you might get a, whether it's like a customer call or a, a marketing thing or or whatever as a founder often some of the big important things can be hard to make space for and so I knew that that accountability was something that I that I wanted in the office hours and there were some weeks that our homework was the only thing that I got done with a, a newborn uh, in tow but it got done because I you know I was gonna show up and and think through this with you that that following week so yeah. That's what I was, you know, overall hoping to get out of office hours. And in terms of what was going on in Savorista at the time, I was, you know, I'd been on mat leave for a while and I just felt like there were some core analyses that I hadn't dug into in a while. And so wanted to use that as an opportunity to do that, as well Mm -hmm. as, you know, we were thinking about different channels and thinking about our marketing budget. And really it all just came back to you know, if we have better gross margins, that allows us to spend more to acquire customers. That allows us to more confidently go into new channels. And so really like profitability was at the core of us being able to to grow the business. Yeah. For those listening who maybe aren't familiar with office hours, talk a little bit about this idea of like homework, right? So typically office hours meets over four week, four consecutive weeks. Every once in a while, if there's a holiday or my birthday, there'll be a week up in between. So it might be five, you know over five weeks, but four sessions during which we meet. There's four up to four founders in any given session so that everybody has at least 15 minutes of dedicated time to talk about their business and and kind of what they're working through. And then the homework that you described, Kate, it's like, you know, you, for example, as I said, came to the first meeting with data and you had sent me an email prior to, it was like, I'm looking (laughs) forward to tomorrow. Here's some information from my P&L. You had done some analysis and provided that to me beforehand, which was amazing. So I had a sense of what we would be looking at day one. 
And then we looked at the data together and we're going to talk about it in, in some detail, but at the end of each session, my goal is to say, okay, this is great. Here's what I recommend you do next. Here's what I think you should look into, or here are some maybe scenarios that you should run. And then you go away and really the work is done separate from the office hours, right? And you bring that work back to the next session. And that's what really allows us to progress, you know, week over week so that you, as I said, hopefully leave more confidently or with some answers, you know, by the end of that four week session. So if I'm remembering correctly, some of those key metrics and insights and, and P&L information from that first meeting included... Actually, but Sarah, before you jump yeah. down there, I do just want to add one more thing that I found it really valuable to also be working through finances with other founders because... Mm. You know, for many of us, our finances are one of the most like vulnerable parts of our business. And to be open and transparent in this kind of, you know, room of confidentiality of other founders who are and may have solved those challenges or looked at those challenges before or who are facing different challenges. It was, you know, in addition to getting your input, it was also really valuable to to work through it with a I guess a cohort of other food founders who are thinking through different aspects of their finances as well. Thank you for adding that. And I will say that you also gave really amazing like feedback and insight to other Thank founders you. who were in the sessions, which is to me, one of my favorite things, because it's interesting to be in my seat, right? Where, as you said earlier, like I have seen a lot of financials. I can understand sort of, I can zoom out and go, okay, what's going on with this business? And then zoom in and go, okay, here's where we need to focus our time and attention. But I have not run a CPG brand. I have not been in the seat of a founder. You know, when when finance intersects marketing, for example, I I have a certain level of experience and knowledge, but then it it ends. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. so part of part of what I think is important is to say that is not my area of expertise. Uh, and is there a founder in the room who, you know, who maybe has some some more insights? But you also bring a certain level of experience in business to to office hours where you could speak intelligently about the finance things too. So so it wasn't that you were like, I'm a founder who doesn't like the numbers or I'm a founder who's like afraid of spreadsheets, <laughs> which I which I think those things are important to add too. You know, mm -hmm. there's a, a great camaraderie. Absolutely. And that that founder insight and input for others, I think is one of the best parts of office I totally hours. agree, Sarah. I think that the office hours were a really good combination of like each founder having you know, really deeply worked on their business. Yep. So having like really deep knowledge of, you know, one business in the the food industry, and then also having you there with your kind of not just deep finance knowledge, but also you, you've looked at a lot of different P&Ls, you've helped a lot of food brands tackle different financial challenges. So both that like deep experience, as well as the broad experience that you brought, I think just made it a really great environment to make a lot of progress in a few weeks and you know, make another friend or a few friends in the <laughs> yes, food industry, yes. which, you know, we all need more of that. Totally. Well, I'm so glad that that has been your experience and, and that, as I said before, as, that you're here to, to share that. So let's dive into sort of what the process looked like for you during office hours. So, mm -hmm. so week one, you showed up with some metrics. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you were looking at day one? Yes. So day one, I was looking at, you know, what, here's my PL over, you know, last year, the, the prior quarter, and really was digging into what were the share of different cost buckets as a percent mm. of my overall revenue, not just percent of my cost structure, but percent of my overall revenue. So for example, you know, my uh, COGS was X percent of revenue and that broke down into our, say, raw coffee and our packaging and shipping. Yeah. And then looking at our different marketing and other expenses as well, just to understand where are the potential needle, needle movers? Because, you, you know, I didn't want to spend the whole four weeks tackling something where it was actually a relatively small cost bucket. So even if I totally eliminated it, it didn't really move the needle in terms of yeah. my margins. That's smart. And so early on, we focused on shipping because mm -hmm. it was a large cost for your e-commerce business. And as you say, it's less related to your value proposition. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So you know, the majority of our business is e-commerce. And so shipping for us is a, a really large cost bucket. And there was, you know, the other large cost buckets would include, you know, the raw coffee that mm -hmm. that's roasted. 
but that's an area that is both really core to our, our value prop, but also our values, right? Like we, we don't want to be purchasing lower quality coffee. We don't want to be squeezing out the producers who are producing this high quality coffee. And so that was an area where we didn't really want to touch that. And so looking at where are the other buckets that, you know, are also large costs, you know, finding ways to reduce costs there would have, yeah. it wouldn't have impact on our suppliers wouldn't have a, that same impact on our customers. And so really we're trying to think about where can we both move the needle financially, but also not have kind of negative repercussions up to other stakeholders. I think that's so important. I think that's so critically important. And I'm so glad that you're sharing that here because sometimes we can approach cost cutting, if you will, with like, wherever I can do it, I will do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the messages I, I try to share here is like, you don't want to just cut costs for the sake of cutting costs, right? It's like, it's like if your labor costs are quote too high for your business, cutting hours is not necessarily going to be the answer because for many reasons, right? But Absolutely. it might be efficiency is what you approach, right? Absolutely. Or if this is an intricate, you know, I think about, you know, some of the chocolate makers that have come through office hours and that we work with. It's like, they're so time intensive to create the chocolate that that these folks are selling. It's like, you don't want to cut hours and there's only so much efficiency you can create in certain parts of the product. So how else can you, you know, cut those costs as you're saying and not affect the value Absolutely. that you want to offer to your customer. I think it's a really, really interesting way of thinking about it. I think that absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of good food founders pride themselves in the quality of their ingredients or that they're paying their team a living wage. And honestly, like it's expensive. And yeah. it is one of the reasons that a lot of good food brands have higher price points than maybe mm -hmm. the much larger brands yeah. have on the shelf. And so really thinking about how do I how do I increase profitability in my business while also not sacrificing facing the values that I have as a, a business owner? It can be a challenging puzzle to solve, but <laughs> yeah. is a is a good place to start. Yeah. So I remember in that first meeting, something that stands out to me is when we were looking at the those cost buckets as a percentage of revenue. Mm -hmm. One of them was your your shipping costs. Mm -hmm. And initially you had looked at it as that percentage of overall revenue. And one of the things that I like to do is to say, what is your shipping cost actually as a percentage of your shipping income? Right. Or something else we we talk about is like the net shipping income essentially, mm -hmm. right? And so just to kind of describe this to folks, basically if you do charge for shipping for any of your products, and we can talk a little bit about your specifics in just a moment, but sort of generally, if you're charging shipping for some of your products, ideally you will have a shipping income line in the revenue section of your P&L so that you can clearly see what that shipping income is and, and also see it separately from your product income. Likewise, you will have shipping expenses and you want to see that expense as a single line in the cost of goods sold section of your P&L. And so then what we're able to do is go, and I'm just pulling imaginary numbers here, but if we have $500 worth of shipping income and we have $1,000 of shipping costs, then we have a negative $500 right? Like we'll, we'll call it net shipping income, or we can say we have a $500 net shopping or sorry, net shipping expense. And basically what we're trying to get to there is to say, okay, we know what our margins are on our product, right? And we can see that with the other data we have on the P&L with all the other kind of like management reporting we've done on our, on our, on our costs and, and our margins and things. But now we have an understanding of how much we are earning or losing on the shipping itself, for our product. And for me, that's an eye-opening moment. And it seemed to be mm -hmm. a little bit of an eye-opening moment for you as well. Absolutely. It was, it was very helpful to think about that, that metric, you know, looked at like what shipping is percent of total income or what percent of our orders paid for shipping, which actually also ended up being pretty eye-opening as well. Yeah. But that net shipping cost, net shipping income, I can't remember which, which word that, which phrase we often went with, but yeah. It was, yeah, it was valuable to see that and see that, okay, because of the current shipping offers that we have, this is taking a, an X percent toll on our overall gross margins beyond, yeah. you know, the product and production costs. So that was, yeah. 
it was substantial in in our case because mm-hmm. we if if it's helpful to share the kind of like the shipping offers that we had yeah, at the time. That would be super helpful, yeah. We were you know it was free shipping over fifty dollars and also free shipping on subscriptions. And some of which also then had a 10% off. So it was free shipping over $50 or our subscription program, which we'll, we'll dive into in a minute, was 10% off plus free free shipping. And the thought process was, you know, we're trying to encourage larger orders. So let's get people from, you know, one or two bags of coffee to say a third bag of coffee to put them over the, the $50 limit. Yeah. Or let's incentivize repeat purchases and subscribers and really kind of build that customer loyalty through that. So it's, it, was, it had a great impact on that front but it was also really expensive. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you start to discover? Because I remember, and it's funny because I'm recalling this from a couple of months ago, but my memory of it, it was like, there was sort of an, oh, moment of like, (laughs) yes. Realization. Yes. So a a couple of the, the, oh, moments through our process first was realizing that because of the shipping offers, only 20% of orders had paid for shipping because mm. other people unlocked free shipping in other ways, which it was what we wanted them to do, but yeah. was still helpful to understand that we had, you know, very little shipping revenue to offset our shipping costs. Yeah. The other thing that was really valuable is when we started looking at profitability on um, kind of order type. So if somebody ordered one 10 ounce bag or they ordered two bags, or if they ordered a large bag, yeah. what, what did the margins look like there? Yeah. And, you know, on larger orders, it, the shipping cost is a smaller share of that that revenue. But the big, I think, uh-oh moment that you are alluding to is when we realized that in our subscription program that over half of our orders were actually just a single bag order. And we had allowed people to have to order just a single bag because we wanted to make it, you know, just as easy, if not easier, as going to the grocery store and just grabbing right. a bag of coffee. And so you could very easily just order a fresh bag of coffee every week through Savorista's subscription program, and people would often just ship one bag at a time. Yeah. So I want to ask a couple questions here Please. because they, these were sort of oh moments as I described them. You're going through your business. Mm-hmm. Let's go maybe like a go back like a year or, or however long ago it was that maybe you implemented this shipping offer and the subscription offers that you have. Can you share a little bit more about like what you were trying to achieve? And then Mm -hmm. the other thing I'm sort of interested in, this happens in every single business. So I'm not, I'm not like picking on you, but I, but it might sound like it when I ask the question, it's like customers start signing up and we have an awareness of sales, but sometimes we don't have an awareness of sort of the bigger picture of how people are buying Mm -hmm. and how our offers are landing in yes. terms of our profitability and, and stuff like that. So can you tell us a little bit about, I guess, how you got here in a sense? Absolutely. So we we rolled out this offer many years ago. So not just a year ago, it was like quite a few years ago. And um, a couple things you know, happened in the business. First, like shipping rates in, have increased significantly over the last few years. Yeah. And we always hate to increase costs for our customers. And so sometimes we delay doing that. And I think this is true for a lot of founders, not just Savorista, that some of those costs creep up, especially with shipping, because the cost of shipping varies for each package based on the size of the package and where you're the package and where you're shipping it to. And so it can, it can creep up silently in the background. And so that was one thing that happened is that we just had been absorbing those increased shipping costs for a while. And then the other thing that happened is when we started, uh, so we're a Midwestern brand. Most of our customers were from the Midwest. We always, we've always had customers across the country, but most of them were from the Midwest. And then over time, as you know, more people would refer their friends to Savorista or gift us to someone, we ended up with more customers across the country. And it's a lot more expensive to ship, you know, a single bag of coffee within the Midwest than it is to ship it to California or Washington yeah. state. And as I dug into the geographic implications, we had more orders coming from states in the West than we did from the Midwest. Wow. And that was actually something I looked into after office hours we were preparing for our call today. I was like, oh, that is also another piece of this is that, yeah. you know, as we are growing nationally, that's great. We're like penetrating new regions and that's awesome, but it's more expensive to ship 
coffee out there. And so that was also having a big impact on our margins that um, I didn't even realize at the time of, of our office hours. Yeah. So I think it was meeting number two, you had run some scenarios. Mm -hmm. So you had, I'm just like looking at my notes here. You sent an email prior to meeting number two and I quoted you <laughs> here. So one of the things you put in the email, cause you were like, TLDR here, you know, here are the highlights and highlight number one was that 54% of your subscriptions were single bag subscriptions. And the quote from the email that I'm going to say here, it was eek, right? <laughs> yes. Eek. Like, so this is something that, you know, you put a subscription in place, you, mm -hmm. because you want to make it easy for people to buy, right? You don't want to make it more challenging than popping to the grocery store to get a bag for your, for your customers who are shopping online. But just over time, right? And you're seeing the sales come in, you're, you are aware, but that number that like 54% of subscriptions being just one bag was something you wouldn't have an awareness of unless you ran the numbers. Exactly. It was way higher than I expected, just kind of based on my intuition of, of the business. Like I expected it to be a large chunk of, of subscriptions, but not mm -hmm. more than half. Yeah. So that was, was quite surprising. And then you just to kind of throw some numbers behind what that what that meant. So if our yeah. average bag of coffee is twenty dollars, and we give people a ten percent discount on it for subscribing, so then we get eighteen dollars of revenue, mm -hmm. and now it's costing us roughly like six bucks to ship it to many parts of the country. Thirty percent of that revenue just goes to shipping. Yeah, which is wow. wild that so much of that revenue was eaten up by just shipping it. Forget creating the product. Yeah. Forget acquiring the customer just the shipping cost. So when, yeah. when that was also a big aha moment, digging into the true cost of, of shipping, because it mm -hmm. was something that kind of had increased in the background for various reasons. And the average yeah. cost per bag was was much higher than, or I guess per, per order, I should say, it was higher than I realized because of both increased rates, but also like the changing geographic spread of our customers. Yeah. I think it's so common. And I used to experience this like when I was a buyer before I even got into finance. There were these, uh, these I, I'm going to call them assumptions that like m my chefs would have and then moving into the finance world that founders have where you think you know your business. You think you know what people are ordering a lot of. You think you know what you're going through most in your inventory or in your kitchen. And when we run the numbers, it's often not the case, right? Because mm -hmm. you might be touching one thing, but someone else on your team might be touching something else, or just your perceptions are off in your very, very, very busy day-to-day -day life of running and you know operating mm -hmm. your business. So that's like totally normal. And I think the other thing too that I want to point out here is we first go to the PNL, right? Like as you did in the, in the first meeting, to go where should we dig deeper right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to make an assumption that like, oh, this kind of cost is going to be my highest cost. And so I'm going to dig into that. Like, don't make an assumption there. Truly look at your numbers, look at the data and go, what seems higher than I want it to be? And then dig in deeper. Because when we looked at, if I'm remembering correctly, it was like 14% of your total revenue was going, was, was shipping costs, right? Yes, and then right. we went from that number to what is our sort of like net loss mm -hmm. on just shipping itself? And he's like, okay, well, we don't like that. Mm -hmm. What? And then we, so then that led us to let's dig a little bit deeper. And then when you did do that di deeper digging, you realize this information of 54% of our subscriptions are getting $2 off plus we are covering the shipping and that has a huge impact on the profitability of this single bag of coffee for 54% of our subscription customers. So it's just like really really big but we got here by first kind of starting out with the with the big set of numbers and then really drilling in. Absolutely. Digging in this deep often or at least in my case required me to like export data from Shopify mm. and do a like do some analysis in Excel and so it wasn't just like a quick report that I yeah. could just look at like, yeah. so like, yes, the, what percent of revenue is, does my shipping account for? Okay. That's a quick thing I can look at in my, in QuickBooks, but to the level that we were digging in, it, that's why it was so helpful to like create this space and accountability of like actually making the time to dig in and like mm. run some of these analyses. Cause they're not necessarily like just there at your fingertips as a, as a small brand. 
That's another really great point that you bring up, Kate, because, you know, one of my issues with things like Shopify and even QuickBooks is like, they're not meant to aid you in financial decision making, right? Mm -hmm. Shopify is an online sales platform and they're going to give you data like, you know, your conversion rate and your sales numbers. And there's a lot of sort of, I would say like high level sales stuff that you're, that they're giving you. But yeah, but yes, when you really want to understand your margins and things, you do have to do some dig deeping because no one is serving it up to you Mm -hmm. in a super easy format. Right. to, To understand. And so, and a lot of people, I think if, you know, you came with a lot of Excel experience and, and this like ability to really dig into the numbers. And for folks who don't, that's something else that we can provide in office hours. It's like, awesome. run this report. You know what I mean? Pull this information, pull this together. You were able to just kind of go, oh, I know what I need to look at now, at least like from my perspective. And, but mm-hmm. if you're someone listening, who's like, I wouldn't even know where to start, like, that's also okay. We can help you, Absolutely. you know, figure that stuff out. I would say in our office hours, people were at different stages in their business Mm -hmm. in in terms of like the types of reports they had or the types of modeling they had. And so it was very, you know, and and everybody was welcome. So I think, you know, don't don't let, if anybody's listening to this and they're considering office hours, I wouldn't want them to feel like not knowing which reports to run right now should hinder them from from signing up. Yeah. Yeah. All levels of business, all levels of financial knowledge, like literally everyone is welcome. It's a, and it's small for a reason so that Mm -hmm. people can get yet the time and attention that, that they need. Thank you. The next thing you did. So in addition to that, that eek moment and and identifying, (laughs) you know, the number of subscriptions that were single bag, you prepared a couple of scenarios for changing that single bag free shipping offer. Can you talk a little bit about like in your mind, why was this your next step. Just really connect all of these dots for our listeners. Absolutely. It was like, first we identified that, you know, single bag orders are, have, you know, have the lowest margin because so much of that shipping or all of the shipping cost needs to be taken out of the revenue of just that one bag, not spread across multiple bags. Second, we realized like, uh uh-oh, that's more than half of our orders. Like that's, (laughs) that's a really big problem. And so then you know, we started brainstorming and I got some input from some of the other people in office hours as well in terms of other things that they had seen or what they did in their business. Mm. Uh, what could different subscription offers look like? And, you know, I ran some different scenarios of if we kept the discount, if we removed the discount, but kept free shipping, if we kept the, the discount, but didn't give free shipping, yeah, just a variety, or if it was like a flat rate shipping on different orders. And so basically I looked at, okay, for, for the the first quarter of the year, how many of my subscription orders were a single bag or two bags or three bags or big bags, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, ran the numbers of the current state of what that, that actually looked like. What was the profitability? What was the revenue and what was the profitability for, yeah. you know, my Q1 subscription program? And then what would the profitability be under each of these different shipping scenarios? So the mm-hmm. Shipping income under the current state was zero, right. but if I charged people for shipping up until a certain dollar value or order size in terms of number of bags, what would that generate in terms of, of shipping revenue to offset the shipping costs? Mm-hmm. And that was really helpful to look at, you know, how would that change the revenue? How would that change the profitability? Profitability, both in terms of margins, but also in terms of dollars. Yeah. And actually the the dollar profitability was very different once I started char- like in my scenarios charging for shipping under certain in certain cases. Yeah. Like it did have an impact on margin, but it had a huge impact on like dollars of profit at the end of the day. Yeah. And I think I, I made a note here that there was a margin improvement across these scenarios of like three mm-hmm. to 6%. And then, yes. yeah, depending on that level of subscription, right? The dollar impact is going to be, you know, quite different. And, and so things looked kind of positive, you know, mm-hmm. for, for these options. But something I really liked that you did with these assumptions was to look at, in particular, there was a two plus bag scenario mm-hmm. that you were looking at. And you didn't assume that like everyone would like stay, mm. right? You you made an assumption like, okay, what does maybe my worst case scenario look like here? And for you, that was 30% of people canceling their subscription and 10% of people upgrading from, let's say one bag to two or more bags, right? I think this yeah, is how so it was. What I, great, great point there. Sorry. So what I did was, you know, first let's look at like, 
if just the same number of orders came through of, you know, single bags, double, two bags, et cetera, like what does yeah. that look like in terms of, of profit? But, you know, customers also make decisions based on the decisions that we make. And so I knew some people would, you know, add an extra bag or extend their order timeline so that they could, you know, consult, I guess, consolidate and have more orders, more bags arrive at once. Yeah. Some people would just say like, heck no, I'm not paying for shipping. Like I'm an Amazon Prime member. I don't pay for shipping on anything. And yeah. so I, I knew that just the like, you know, ap applying my new shipping offer to my Q1 numbers was not going to be the scenario that we were in. And so I, I thought of a somewhat, I thought it was maybe not the worst case scenario. Cause I would say, actually you asked me, okay, so what happened? Well, we'll get to what you asked me as like the okay. worst case scenario, but it seemed like worse than I would have expected based mm -hmm. on just, you know, charging for, for shipping. So I did exactly what you said. I assumed, okay, so let's say 30% of these orders just disappear. Customers cancel. They're upset about. Or canceling, but actually we had more profit dollars and margin at the end of the day. And yeah. so it gave me more confidence in, in unrolling this offer that we're, we're planning to make this change in about a month or so, but knowing, you know, running different scenarios of like, what happens if it doesn't go to pl according to plan or if things are worse than I expect it to yeah. be? Yeah. What financial position does that, does that put me in? And yeah. then you responded actually with, okay, great. Now what if everybody cancels? <laughs> I didn't remember asking that. <laughs> you, you, you asked that. It's just kind of like a double check of like, hey, what would this mean for your business? If yeah. worst case scenario, nobody thinks it's actually going to happen. But if every single person canceled. And I think my, my first response was like, man, that's going to be an ego. <laughs> All of my, you know, a good share of our customer base would cancel their subscriptions. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, we, we ran some numbers and I was like, okay, well, this would be the impact to revenue. This would be the impact to our, our profit. And because they were, you know, lower margin orders, the impact to revenue to the top line was much higher than the impact to our gross profit. So still, you know, hoping for not that scenario, obviously, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but it was good to just kind of, yeah. I, you know, run that extreme of like, hey, what if it just goes away altogether? Um, yeah. Look at look at that, and then you know, kind of dial back from that. Yeah, I'm glad I asked you that question. That seems very <laughs> that seems very in line with my with my kind of coaching style and personality. <laughs> because two things that I want to talk about here, just kind of sit in in this part of the process, is one is you never know. Like you can only control so much right? You can control what goes on inside of your business. You have zero control, I think, as you said earlier, about how your customers are going to respond to the decisions that you make. They're going to make their own decisions. Mm -hmm. So you are hypothesizing that there are going to be some folks who aren't going to want to roll with it and make a change. Um, they're not going to want to pay shipping. And so you had that scenario. Something that rolls through my mind, particularly when we've got a very low margin offer, is that despite how much the customer likes the product, charging the appropriate price, whether it be for the product or for shipping or, you know, kind of crafting the product offering that that is beneficial to the customer may price some people out of being able to purchase the product. And that is okay. It, you know, as you have said, maybe not here on the podcast, but I know definitely in the conversations that like you don't want to price people out of being able to afford your product. You ideally want to keep 100% of your customers. Mm -hmm. And, and for so many good food founders, there is a struggle because you, it feels bad to price people out of being able to buy your product. But the alternative there is that you keep selling at too low of a margin, you keep losing money and your business doesn't survive long-term, right? Absolutely. And Sarah, if I can just add to that, I, like really, as I think about some of our long-term customers, I just ran some numbers before the show. We have a lot of them who have ordered with us more than a hundred times. And wow. a few who are like very close to approaching their 
200th order. Wow. And so these are people who were with us when we didn't have any real branding, when we were just (laughs) getting started and have just really been on this journey with us. Right. And so these are the people that as we were early in the early days thinking about like, who are our core customers? Who are our target audiences? Who are we going after? Like they were some, and some of them people that we interviewed, like, Hey, you've been with us for a while. And at that point, that was just a few orders. Like, (laughs) you know, tell us why you're drinking decaf. And so yeah, in many cases, especially as founders who want to serve their their customers, you have an like an emotional relationship with these customers. And so pricing the thought of pricing them out is yeah. is really hard. Yeah. And sometimes then we delay making the decisions that we need to make for the business itself because like the, the business is also a stakeholder in this relationship that we have to to really consider. Yeah. Can you share with us what decision? you've Mm -hmm. made around shipping and subscriptions? Because really it's the two connected. It's not just the shipping cost change because the subscriptions and that single bag subscriber were having such an impact on your margins and profitability. What decision did you make to move forward with, you know, after going through this process? Absolutely. So we decided that, you know, First thing is there is no free shipping on a single bag, period. Like there's no scenario in which we are are doing that. Yeah. And so for new subscribers, after we launch this offer, we're just going to keep the free shipping threshold as the same the same as the rest of our business. So once mm. you spend fifty dollars on an order, then you get free shipping. We're keeping the ten percent discount on the subscriptions. Yeah. But the free shipping has the same threshold as the rest of the business. We decided that for customers who were with us before this to have the free shipping be at two bags versus it would be a third bag for for new customers just to kind of both ease that transition and also appreciate them for just being such long time customers that, yeah. that we really value them they clearly really value us they've been purchasing it for us for a long time and so yeah. we tried to to find a middle ground there yeah that's great One of the things we talked about during office hours is, and this is something I talk with a lot of clients and and coaching members about is like, how do we roll out this change? How do we do this in a way that like, it feels okay for us and we're sort of bringing our customers along with us as opposed to just springing a price change or a subscription model change on them. So I think that's an important component to talk about. So you were in office hours in which month? I'm sorry, I'm blanking on June. Maybe? I think it might have been June. June. I yeah, I, I think you're either. right, June. And so we're recording this in August, just to give mm-hmm. people a timeline, right? Of Absolutely. sort of like, you know, these things don't have to be decided and implemented overnight. In fact, we <laughs> encourage you to take your time in in making big decisions like this because this is a big decision. It's one that's going to have a positive impact on your your bottom line. But you, you I, I think, especially as a good food founder, you want to communicate and kind of not shock your your core customer base. So absolutely, we worked through it in June. You made your decision. It is mm-hmm. now August. Tell us what the rollout of this looks like and, and the timeline there. If I can add one more thing. Sure. Before planning for what to communicate to customers, I checked in with the subscription app that we use, mm. Atomic, just to make sure some of the different scenarios we were considering were more straightforward than others. And so I okay. just wanted to touch base with them to just to make sure the subscription app could like handle whatever our plans were and make sure that, you know, I wasn't deciding, Hey, this is what I'm going to do. And then in the middle of building it, realized that it's, you know, it's not possible um, or that I would need to make those changes. And they, they're fantastic. They actually like helped us build this amazing feature of, um, for our shuffles, which is a, um, like basically like a roaster's choice where somebody mm. signs up to be surprised at what, what coffee they're getting. And so they just yeah. have this, this like great feature to make that really simple on the back end for us. So I, I already had a really good relationship with them. So I wanted to check in with them. So, even, but I guess what I'm saying, even if you don't have a great relationship, yeah. you know, with the founding team of the subscription product you're doing, like at least check their specs to make sure yeah. it can do <laughs> what you want to roll out before you, you know, finalize any decisions. But that being said, so our, plan is to communicate this, you know, a few weeks in advance and, and just be really honest that, you know, costs have increased. We've hesitated to pass on those. I shouldn't hesitate, but we've like delayed passing on those costs because we really care about our customers and no one likes price increases, but unfortunately, like 
this is where we're at and we need to now we are at a point where we do need to make this change yeah and then also emphasize the different ways that somebody can still avoid paying shipping if they want to so you know maybe that's buying a bigger bag of coffee or consolidating your orders so you're ordering you know two bags once a month versus one bag every two weeks. And yeah. so just giving them the options of if they don't want to pay shipping, how they can still be a Savory's to subscriber and not pay shipping or I guess keep their free shipping yeah. within kind of the, the framework of our new subscription offering that we are unrolling soon. Yeah. Do you think there's going to need to be any education around like how long a bag of coffee will stay good? Like if someone's used mm. to getting one bag of coffee every let's just say month and now they're going to get two bags of coffee every two months. Like, do you think there's like any other kind of communication that would have to happen? That's a great question. I hadn't thought about that, but I think that is, is great. I'm going to make a note of that and include (laughs) that in our, in our email, but all of our coffee is flushed with nitrogen, which helps Mm. slow down the oxidization. So when coffee is exposed to air and to oxygen, that is what, causes the flavors to kind of degrade slowly over time. Interesting. So fun facts about coffee, like the more whole bean it is and the more sealed off it is, the longer it will last. So if you have a unopened bag of whole bean coffee, if you open it, you know, a week after it was roasted or a month after it's roasted, it, you know, the flavor will be very similar. But if you are, if you grind your coffee and leave it open and exposed to the air, the flavor will decline faster. So I think that's great, Sarah, to just kind of remind people like, hey, here's how you keep your coffee fresh longer. Yeah. So that it makes it a more obvious choice for people to kind of consolidate some of their orders and order more, but less frequently. Yeah. And so we, you know, you, you noted, you know, you're rolling this out like in a month or so, Mm -hmm. we don't know what the outcomes will be. And, you know, whether it's a full episode or maybe we just record a little (laughs) bonus content, you know, we'll check in and and say like, how is it going? And did you make any modifications, alterations? Like how did the community, I think a debrief on, on sort of the things you can't control Mm -hmm. and those outcomes is, is maybe some, some additional like good context to have for people. But I wanted to have you on the show before the rollout on purpose, because Mm -hmm. I think again, like we can only control what we can control. We can only have an effect on like the decisions that, that we are making. And then there's so much that's outside of our control. And this is important work to do, whether it's around your shipping and subscriptions or something else in your business, like kind of digging in and doing this work and going, here's what we need to do to be in a good financial position. Here's what we need to do to continue on in our business, right? And reach whatever goals, you know, there are. I want to focus first and foremost on that work and not necessarily if it's a win or not after the fact, you know, if that's a very important thing. So thank you for joining me before you've actually rolled it out, but we will check in with you. I think once, once you do, you talked a bit about the importance of downside scenario planning. And I think that this is an important message to our founders. So I want to include it here in this conversation as well. You've got sort of, I'm going to call it advice for people. So I'm going to give you the floor (laughs) to to talk about this. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, you know, to start when we were planning for our subscription change, we looked at not just, Hey, if everybody orders the same order type, what would that do to our our revenue and our our margins? We also looked at, okay, well, what if, you know, it's not that great and people cancel or fewer people convert to a larger bag than we expect. And then we looked at actually, thanks to your your (laughs) advice, what if everybody cancels? Building those scenarios is so important of understanding well, what if everything doesn't go as well as I, as I want it to? And I think, you know, as founders, it's really easy to, not just as like food founders, but, you know, talking to other entrepreneurs, I know it's easy to forget to really understand like what could go wrong yeah, and to plan for that early on. And so first I just want to say how important it is to not just plan for like the best case scenario or what you think is a base case scenario, which could honestly also be more optimistic than reality, yeah. but to also think about, you know, what happens if it goes worse than I plan or what if this one thing goes wrong and particularly looking at, you know, what are the, some of the, the risks here and, and modeling in or creating scenarios of 
what happens if that goes worse than you plan yeah and doing that early on so you can think about well what are the options of what i can do if i find myself in one of these you know less than ideal scenarios and you have so many more options at your disposal of things that you could do to course correct or mitigate a bad outcome mm -hmm. if you start early like it's a lot harder if you are later reacting to a bad scenario and trying to like scramble to get to a better place. So yeah. just wanted to encourage everyone, you know, it, it takes longer for sure, but it's worth, you know, looking at a couple different scenarios early on to see what are the potential range of outcomes and to think about like, okay, yeah. what would you do if those outcomes are not as great as you want? It's just so, so important. Yeah. I like to think about always what like what if the worst possible scenario happens and there was a book i cannot remember the name of which is typical every time like a i wanted to like reference a book i'm like i don't remember the title I, it was an i listened to it as an audiobook and so it's like the title's not mm -hmm. stuck in my head but he talks about basically the entire book is about removing emotions from your decision making process mm -hmm. and i, I know that. for myself when I want something really bad, it is very easy to convince myself that it's all going to work out really great. And tip and and typically there are signs that I'm making an emotional decision. And for me, it's like feeling like I need to move now. I need to make the decision now, right? It's like time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. If I feel like time is of the essence and something has to happen now, now I've learned to be like, hold on, stop. This is an emotional decision you are making and you should definitely loop in some people from the outside. Like not even just mm -hmm. the people in your business, but let's talk to somebody on the outside who can effectively go, wait, what's the like worst, worst, worst case scenario, right? Sort of that was the role I played for you. And I think it's mm -hmm. important to have that role because it's a possibility, right? There are so many possibilities of what the outcome could be. As entrepreneurs, we're taught to like be positive. Failure is not an option. Guess what? Sometimes it happens. And the more prepared you are, the better, right? So if we look at, okay, you know, the worst case scenario here is I lose all my revenue and I only have two weeks of cash runway. Well, that means I probably would have to close my business or I probably would have to have access to money from somewhere, right? And so going through the scenario, and I don't think that would have been one of like that wouldn't be an outcome of the worst case scenario in your situation, but mm -hmm. for some business decisions, it is. And you have to ask yourself, am I okay with the sort of, what did he call them? Like, like third factor outcomes of a scenario, mm -hmm. right? So you do something, your customers make a decision. And then sort of the, the third layer is like the effects on your business of your customers' decisions. And those are very much out of your control. And if one of the even remote possibilities is that you run out of money, you really have to check in with yourself and go, would I be okay taking on more debt? Would I be okay closing the business? And sometimes people have been working so hard and for so long, they go, you know what, this is my last effort. And if this doesn't work, then I am okay closing the business. That's good to know right? Mm -hmm. Before you get there. Other folks would say, heck no, I don't want to close the business if that happens. So let me do a little bit of preparation and make sure, can I, do I have access to cash? Do I have access to an investment? Do maybe I build up my runway a little bit more if I can before I implement this decision? So it's just kind of speaking to what you said of like the earlier you start this process and this planning, the more prepared you can be for, for the myriad of outcomes that can occur. Absolutely. This is great advice. Absolutely, Sarah. You're, you're totally right. And I think for founders, of course, you're optimistic for the potential, yeah. potential of your business because you started the business and you are working really hard in that business. So of course, you're going to be optimistic yeah. and emotionally attached to this like a positive outcome. But looking at all the scenarios that could happen is really important. And then and you mentioned debt. So I just want to add to that, that you know, if you if you raise with equity versus debt, those have very different implications in terms mm -hmm. of like kind of short-term cash flow needs. So if you're if you have a monthly debt payment that you need to to cover, mm -hmm. you you really have to make sure you're factoring that into your cash flow scenario and either exactly what you're saying, figure out how do you make sure you have either access to more cash or capital or are you you know no are you willing to put more money yourself into your business? Yeah. Or can you renegotiate some things if it's a loan from like an uncle versus from a bank. And so yeah. I think just, you know, thinking through particularly if you've borrowed money to build a business or you've invested your own money to build a business, you know, that's, that's really critical. And obviously, you know, you don't want to like 
not think about your equity investors either because yeah. they're also very important, but they're not expecting you to pay them however many, however much money each month to be paying back any loans that you might've taken. Yeah, that's a great point. I think debt is so, I mean, it has to be repaid. And that's like a whole nother conversation that we may have on another day. But yeah, I think that this is really great advice. I encourage folks to, you know, just start, like, I'm just going to sort of say a starting point here. Look at your PL on a monthly basis. <laughs> see yeah. what you see. See if there's something that you think, hey, this could change. You know what I mean? This is an area of impact, which is sort of where you started this process and see what you find. I think it's important for us to say that this is not the one and only change you are making in your business, but for the sake of podcasting, we're really focusing on one thing, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't the world be amazing? Wouldn't business be so great if it was just like one thing that makes your business, you know, more profitable and, and it wasn't multifaceted, you know? <laughs> yes. Business is more complex than that, which yeah. makes it more, you know, interesting and fun day to day, but definitely yeah. has its own challenges. Yeah. But we wanted to zero in on this topic. I thought, again, the way that you worked through it is something that others can learn from. Kate, thank you again so much for, for joining me here today to talk through your process and this ever important scenario, especially around shipping and subscriptions, really kind of important things to customers these days and getting it right as a founder for your business is, is really important. So just want to say thank you again for sharing your process with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And I, I got so much out of office hours and I hope this is useful to, to other listeners as well. Thank you. And before we go, in case mm. there are listeners out there who are like, I need to get my hands on some of this half-calf and decaf coffee, where can they learn more about Savorista? Yes. So you can find us at savorista.com and also on Instagram or Facebook at, at Savorista Coffee. Amazing. And we're going to put some links to that info in the show notes as well. Can I offer a discount to your listeners? If you would like to, you absolutely can. Sure. Um, now that I have, you know, a good understanding of my shipping and my <laughs> profitability, I feel more confident offering discounts. I love it. Yeah. So if you would like to 20% uh, off, you can use the code CFO at saberista.com. We appreciate that. Thank you, Kate. All right. Thank have a great day. You. Thanks. You too. Bye. If you'd like to learn more about any of the tools or resources mentioned in today's episode, visit thegoodfoodcfo.com. Thank you for joining us here today. If you enjoyed this episode or found it helpful or inspiring in any way, please share it with your founder friends on social and rate and review the podcast wherever you listen. It's the number one way to help good food founders find the show. We'll be back with a brand new season on September 30th.